Great, thanks Tom. Um, yeah, so as Tom said, my name is Emma Vesterson. I am a senior data analyst at the Health Foundation and I will be sharing some of my tips on how to reshape and combining data in R. Uh, if I can get things to click. Uh, so this session is kind of aimed at advanced beginners. Uh, I think probably if you're more advanced, you can still get something out of it. But I will assume that you are familiar with R and the Tidyverse. And if you want to follow along, the slides are available from this link. And I think Tom is going to share that in the chat as well. Yes, um, I have them. Perfect. Also, if you want to, you can try to code along. You don't have to. And any of the questions that I've set up, you'll be able to answer them without you know, looking at the data. But if you want to, you can download the data from this GitHub repo, which again, I think Tom will share or has shared already. And you need to have the Tidyverse here and the Lubridate packages installed and loaded. Um, we will focus on two packages today, one called TidyR, which is what you use for reshaping data, and one called DeepLyR, uh, which is what we'll use to join the data sets together. And I think many of you will probably be familiar with DeepLyR um, because it has all the mutate and select functions, but I think we'll probably cover some slightly different functions today. So just to get us started and to make sure that this Mentimeter thing is working, uh, I would like to know what your favourite R package is. Um, so if you go to menti.com and enter this code, and again, it should be in the chat, um, then we'll, I'm looking forward to seeing what your, what your favourite package is. Yeah, so just to note on that Mentimeter, I've posted the direct link that you can click on, open it in your web browser. Um, that will just work on your computer then. or if you want to just keep it open on your phone um, you can enter that code when you go to the website menti.com if you um if I'll you've got into menti open. yeah if you if you go to menti you can just leave it open for this entire session and then as we've got a couple more questions that come through we'll um be able to show them off but it looks like we've got some responses coming through now no I'll have to refresh and see if it works. Um, yay. OK, so it seems like people are able to access Menti, and I think this is also a good opportunity. If you do want to code along, you might want to go and grab grab the code or, uh, or grab the, the slides now. Um, so we've got Dplyr, which we'll be covering. Obviously, a big thing for Tidyverse, which is, I guess, what covers covers everything. So. Um, and then leaflet, which is also a really good packet for maps. Um, but that's great that that works. And yes, Tom said, just keep that one open because we'll have a few other questions later. Um, and also just a quick thing, because I know that some, sometimes people get stuck on this. So the first time you use the package, you need to install it. And you can do that using install.packages and then the name of the package. Once you've done that, you can just load it, but you need to load it using this library function. So I think a common thing that happens when people start out with R is that they try to use the package. They know they've installed it, but they can't figure out how to load it. And that's how you use library. So you don't need to install it every time you want to use it. The other thing I just briefly want to cover is this pipe. Um, so these two statements do the exact same thing. But I think that the pipe allows you to um, create these piped statements instead of nested statements. So what this is doing, you take an object called me and then you apply a function called wake up, get out of bed, get dressed and leave the house. Um, and you can tell that I wrote this before the pandemic because I had an option of leaving the house, which obviously um, no one's really, very few people are doing now. Um, but it allows you to kind of avoid these really hard to read statements. And my code is quite full of these pipes. So I just want to make sure that everyone was familiar with them. And if you're impressed by how quickly I create my pipes, it's because I'm using this keyboard shortcut, which is Control Shift M or Command Shift M if you're on a on a Mac. Um, and it will honestly speed speed up your typing by so much. So why talk about reshaping data and joining data sets together? So as an analyst, and I think in particular during COVID times when I've been using a lot of open data, you come across a lot of not necessarily bad data, but poorly formatted data. So stored in spreadsheets in ways that 
you, you're not quite sure how someone came up with that format. Um, so we need a way to address that. Um, and in particular, we need a consistent way of storing data and a consistent format. Um, and Hadley Wickham, who is actually the author of many of the packages that you mentioned earlier, has come up with a, this concept of tidy data um, to help us kind of have a consistent format for data, but also which then makes it easier to approach every analysis in the, in the same way. So the, there are three main principles. So the first one is that each variable should form a column as you can see here, each observation should be a row and each cell should contain a single value. And I think this is quite an abstract when you start looking at it. It's not super clear, but hopefully if you keep this in mind as we go through, you'll be able to see what I mean. Um, so we're going to use the tidy R package to essentially get a clean data set, sorry, a tidy data set. Um, and there are two main functions in this package. So you've got pivot longer, um, which essentially means that you'll end up with more rows. So this is usually how I remember it. So if you look at this before table, each country appeared once and you had two columns, one for 1999 and one for 2000 with some measurements. Um, once you've reshaped that uh, and made it longer, you've now got two entries for country A, one for 1999 and one for 2000. Uh, and depending on what you want to do, this format might be a lot easier to work with. You've also got kind of the the opposite function uh, called pivot wider, where you will end up with more variables or at least fewer rows, depending on how on how many on a few different factors. Uh, so if you look at this example here, for example, I realize some of it's cut out in this before table. Country A appears four times, so twice for each year, once once for cases and once for population me measurements. Uh, so 1999, 2000, and once you've made the data set wider, each country now appears once per year, uh, but with one column for cases and one col uh, column for uh, population. Um, so that again is usually a, a more sensible way of keeping your data depending on, on what you want to do. So I think I'm assuming that I have many NHS analysts listening, and I think this is a format that will be very fam familiar to you. So this is a very standard kind of ONS or NHS England format to publish data in. Um, so you've got kind of a, an area name and then you've got some kind of measurement, which is here. Here it's how many calls were answered within 60 seconds um, when people died at 111. Uh, and then one date per column, which is, you know, a person might be really happy because you can very quickly see that, you know, there were more calls on this day than this day. Uh, but a computer or an analyst will be quite upset by this format because it makes it really, really hard to work with. Um, so what I've done is I downloaded that data set that you saw a screenshot of and I've saved it in, a, in a, an R data format or a small part of it just to use as, as an example. So you can you probably recognize the format and it's just been the variables have been slightly. Um, the variable names have slight, changed slightly because it doesn't like blank spaces. Um, so looking at that data set, there are quite a few different things that you might want to do. And these are probably all things that I was asked to do uh, during the COVID, the first kind of bit of COVID when we were analyzing public data. So you might want to plot the total number of calls over time or create a seven day rolling average. And there's going to be a massive headache with the current format because how if you want to create a seven day rolling average, you're going to have to add seven different columns together and then next time you need to do column seven to eight and it, it actually it gets tricky really, really quickly. Um, so it's time for our first proper Mentimeter question. So we have this data set um, that looks like this. What do you think is a sensible next step? Do we want to make it longer? Do we want to make it wider or do we want to just leave it as is? I'm going to move over to Mentimeter with the second one and I'm hoping that Thomas will do the same thing because he's actually in control of, he's a puppet master. <laughs> I, I've moved it across for you so hopefully you should all see that question now. Um.
I think the one thing to, you might have to refresh yeah. as the results start coming in. This is, um... Yay. Um, okay, so we've got no answers for don't bother which I think is a good thing because hopefully that means I convince you that it's not a good idea to try to analyze that type of data, like data in that format. Uh, we've got a lot of people saying that you want to make the data longer, which is the right answer. And I'll try to explain why we don't want to make the data set wider. So sometimes, so we're actually just going to go into our studio and look at this data. Sometimes there are data sets that you can make both longer and wider, depend and it, the right decision depends on what you want to do. So it's not true that a wide data set is always better or a long data set is always better. It depends on what you want to do. But in this situation where, let's look at the, the data. So I've called it CITREP, because it comes from the CITREP data set. Making this wider, would for example mean that we would spread this state so that this number was one column, this number was another one and this was another one. And it's not really clear what we would want to do with that. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you how to uh, reshape the data so that's long and I'm going to call it sitrep long. And I just want to check with people as well that just Please just put it in the comments or in the chat if me typing is really distracting and I'll try to figure out what I can do with that. And actually what we're going to do is just, you can always get help in R by going to pivot, by doing question mark and the um, function you're interested in. Um, and I'm going to move Tom up to the corner. Um, so I can tell that pivot longer wants a data input um, and I've put that data input up here um, and this and I pipe it into my function. It then wants me to specify which columns I want to pivot. And actually in this data set, it's a lot easier to say which ones I don't want to pivot because I've got all of these date columns and then I've just got a year and an NHS uh, 111 area name that I don't want to pivot. So what I'll do is just specify the ones that I want to stay the same. Uh, which is sent to this one, one, one area name and year. And actually, this is all I need to specify for now. Um, and but we can actually do better than what we get out of this. So if you look at this, it's now in a long format, but my new variables don't have very sensible names. So it's called name and value. So what I'm going to do is just specify that I want them to be called something else. Uh, so there's this argument called names two. Um, where I'm specifying where I want the old variable names to go to. And that was just a day in the month, so that's what I'm going to call it. And then I can specify what, where I want my values to go. Um, and I want this column to be called calls, but I want to spell calls with two L's because it's the conventional way of doing it. Um, so if we look at this now, it's actually got a slightly more you know, recent, it's got reasonable variable names, which in the long run, you'll be really grateful that you did. And now that we have this data set, it's actually really easy to um, work with. So here, for example, I want to have a proper date so that I can sort things by it. Um, and all I need to do is deal with the data set in ex like the way you would with a normal data set. Uh, so here, for example, I can create a new variable, variable called date. I will paste together the day and month and the year columns or variables. And then I will use this function from label date to create a proper date. Um, so this DMY stands for day, month, year. And I'd really recommend that people look into the um, label date package when you, if you're working with dates, because it's really, really good. Uh, so if we look at citrep long again, you can now see that there's another, there's a function at the end, sorry, there's a column at the end called date and it's a slightly better, a better date. Um, and we can now do loads of things. So for example, we can calculate calls by region 
doing this so we can say group group by NHS on one area name um, and then summarize um, total calls and so I don't know if you noticed earlier but this data set's got missing values so what I'll do is I'll specify this na.rm true just to make sure that it just ignores those uh, those numbers. So we've now got this other data set where you know I've got the total calls over time for each area. Um, we can also for example plot calls over time. Um, so when doing that we don't even have to create a new save a new data set we can just do this. Uh, group by group by new variable date instead. Uh, and we can, sorry, I want to use summarize because I want fewer rows in the end. Uh, we can call it total course again. Uh, and we'll soon have a nice plot um, or an average looking plot because I'm not going to spend too long actually sorting it out. But I want X on the, sorry, I want the date on the X axis and I want the total calls on the y-axis and then say that I actually want to add some uh, just some points to see to look at the pattern. Um, so I mean this is not a very nice looking plot uh, but it's taken me four rows and it's actually a lot easier than trying to grab each um, each column before like you would have to do in the old format. Um, so sometimes you might want to actually reshape some data uh, and then reshape it back, um, which might sound counterintuitive. But here, for example, I want to calculate the cumulative sum by area. Um, so I'm going to group by um, NHS 111 area and then I'm going to arrange by date to make sure it's in the right order um, and then I'm going to mutate and call this calls commu um, and then use this function called com cumulative sum for calls and you can see actually let, let's just look at it uh, properly you can see that it's now got this it's got this new variable and is adding you know the previous value but it needs to sorry it needs to be sorted by area name so you can see that you know this number is the sum of these two um, and this will obviously make a slightly different plot um, but after that I might decide that I want to go back to my old format and that's when we'll start looking at this pivot wider function. Um, so let's just look at the help again uh, but for this different function. So again it takes the data set and this creates the data set that I want. Um, I then need to specify an ID column and what I want to end up with is the kind of regions in one column and then date. So I want to go back to what I had before but I want to have a slightly different value. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a good idea to store data in this format, but sometimes you have to because it might be that you're sending on to someone else who's using it for a specific reason. Uh, but I need to specify an ID column and I want that to be the NHS form one area name. Uh, and then I need to specify where I want the names to come from. Uh, and I want that to be the date variable. Um, and that's so that's a new name for the for the variables and I want the values to come from this new variable that I created called calls uh, CMU um, and then we can look at this and yeah we're essentially back to what we had before but I've created obviously a new um, 
these values on you and it might be that you want to have it you might just want to have it in this format so i'm just going to go back to my slides and click click through so again if you're looking at the slides I've made sure that everything I've live coded is also in here, potentially with slightly different variable names and a slightly nicer plot. Um, so we're now going to just move on to a different data set. Um, and this one is called US rent income, and it has information about the median income and, re uh, and rent for each state in the US. So you can see what it looks like here. Um, you've got an ID for the, and the name of a state, and then you've got a variable, and then two different ways of estimating that variable. So one, one which is an estimate and one which is a median income. Um, and this is actually quite similar to the example I showed earlier for Pivot Wider. So what we're gonna do is make that data set wider so that we have uh, more columns. Um, so, just going to use that directly. It should be loaded in my data set because I have uh, that package loaded. I want to make it wider. Uh, so let's just for a second actually um, pretend that we're only interested in this estimate function. This MOE function, uh, sorry, variable doesn't exist. Um, then what we can do is just say ID columns. We want that to be uh, the geo ID and the name. And then we want the names for the new variables to come from variable. Um, and we want the values to come from um, estimate. Uh, so I'm going to make this bigger so you can see. So you can now see that we've gone from, we've gone to a new format where we've got one column for income and one column for rent. Um, and you, this is a value that corresponded to the estimate. So what if I was also interested in this other variable called uh, MOE? I'll show you which one it is. Um, so if you're also, if you're interested in both the estimate and the MOE, what you can do, and I think this is where it gets really clever, is you can specify multiple um, values from, and it will create multiple variables for you. So if I now do this and close the bracket, I've now got four new columns, an estimate for the income, an estimate for the rent, and then this OME income. Uh, so you've actually quite quickly created a way bigger data set that you can use for things. And you might, for example, you know, look at the relationship between the estimated income and the estimated rent. Um, so I've done that here, and this is a plot that you then can look at to see that there's some kind of linear relationship between the two. Um, so just a quick note, you might have noticed when I was typing these out that when you're using pivot longer and you're specifying variable names and they need to be quoted because you're creating new variables but in pivot wider the names from and the values from shouldn't be quoted because you're actually referring to data sets that you already have in your data frame and i think this might be a very minor detail but once you've used them a lot more and especially if you used gather and spread which is what was used before this is a lot it's very nice to have this consistency and you can always just think about am i creating something new when am I putting in something that I've already had? So I've now got an even worse example of, um, of a data set. So this is a data set uh, from the TidyR package again uh, called WHO, uh, and it has data on TB cases. So you can see the first three columns are related to the country, and then you've got a year, and then you've got a bunch of these variables with, incredibly strange names, you can see them printed. Uh, once you look at them in a bit more detail or read the help file, what you realise is that there's actually some kind of method to this madness or to this method. Uh, and that is that you always start with the word new. And then you have the method of diagnosis. You've got the gender, and you've got the age group. So this one, for example, is relapse, female, age group 15 to 24. 
And I think if the first example that I started out with, that one you probably could have sorted out in Excel, this one would be a lot harder because you've got, I think, 60 columns. But you can do this quite quickly in, in R and pivot longer. Um, so what we'll start doing is use this who data set. I want to pivot longer. We've given it the data set. The columns, I'm actually just going to say a new, I know that all these columns have the word uh, new in it, in them. So I'm just going to say I want to pivot all the columns that have contained the word new. Um, and then I want to, I want the names. to go to uh, I've got three columns so I've got my diagnosis uh, the next one was sex or gender uh, and then I've got an age group um, and this is where I'm going to cheat a bit and go and look at what I've done before because this is an example from one of the vignettes um, so what you can do is specify this pattern of what, because there's obviously a pattern to the variable names. Um, and I've stolen this um, regular expression, but I have done it for other data sets and it's actually not super hard to, to specify if there's some kind of method. Um, and each of these full stops specify a specific group. So I'm going to run this and you can see that it works. But if I say removed this, it's telling me that I haven't defined enough groups. So it will kind of warn you if you've specified uh, the wrong the wrong number. But if we just look at this data set, I think most people will agree that this is going to be a lot easier to work with than anything else, uh, like in the other format. So, um, and I would have struggled to sort that out in Excel or probably other programming languages as well. Uh, well, I'm sure it can be done in most languages. So again, I've left it in here for you to um, look at later if you want to. We're going to move on to combining data sets. So it's really, really rare that your data is just in one table or one data set. So quite often you need to combine different tables for different data sources. Um, and you can do that with, with dplyr. And I'm just going to have a bit of a warning before we move on to this, because I think that when you join data sets together or combine data sets, that's one of the places where things can go really, really wrong. Uh, so you just need to be, it's worth taking a minute to just think about what you think your data will look like once you're done and what you're expecting. Do you expect every row in every data set to match up perfectly? Is it fine for some to not, to not work? Just, I've been in situations where we've not done that at that stage and you can end up in quite tricky situations, say a month later when you realise that something went wrong. So the first question I ask myself is, do I want to add more rows or do I want to add more columns? And if you want to add more rows, it's actually usually fine. Um, you can use this function called bind rows to combine different data sets. So I've used, for example, monthly GP appointments are published with one file per month and once you've read them in you can just combine all of them together into one big data set. Um, so columns with the same variable names will be stacked uh, but you do want to just check that um, the variable names are the same because otherwise you will end up with missing missing values but it won't it won't give you an error. So if you want more columns is slightly more complicated, but you will be fine. Uh, there is kind of the equivalent for columns called bind calls, uh, but I rarely use it for things that aren't toy examples because it doesn't actually respect the order of the observations. So quite often in data sets, you'll have a variable or multiple variables that will identify your observations that we want to join on. So we want to make sure that if we're looking at patient data and we're adding test data, we want to make sure that test data goes to the right patient. We can't just combine the columns next to each other. Um, and I think if you know SQL, uh, the syntax is very, very similar. And I've actually gone from dplyr to uh, SQL and it really helps. So I think hopefully you'll find it fairly straightforward. 
So there are two different groups of mutating of, of joins. So the first one is this group called mutating joins, where you both where you combine variables from two tables. So you'll start by matching on the two on the kind of ID that you have, and then it will copy over variables from one table to the other. Um, so you've got all kinds of different versions. You've got an inner join that only keeps observations that are in both data sets. You've got a full join that just keeps everything. A left join that keeps everything that's in data set X, but ignores observations that only occur in, in data set Y. And then you've got right join, which is kind of the opposite of left join. And I think only really exists because if you're piping something and you want to join in another data set, it's just convenient to be able to have the kind of mirrored version of that function. So we're going to go back to the NHS 111 data from before. Um, and we've now got one data set with all the calls. And then we've got another one with all the calls that were answered within 60 seconds. Uh, so this is what these two data sets look like. You can see that they've got this common variable uh, and this date variable. This date one has got a different name, but that's fine. Um, and I want to combine these two data sets using the region name and the date. And I want to keep all the observations, even if they don't, if they only exist in one of them. So which type of join should I use? And it's time for the next next Mentimeter question. Um, all right, so hopefully I should have sent it to the next question now. So you should see that come up okay. on your devices. Um, while we're waiting for some people to answer, um, we had one quick question come in um, around uh, the pivot longer function about it, how does it choose the, the values and the name? So it, it chooses name and value as the column default values, but um, I think you've kind of showed that after there are the um, arguments to the pivot longer function that allow you to choose whatever you want for those yeah. column names. So, so I'll just what you want to do for the pivot longer is that you specify, I'll show it for the, one of the easier ones. Um, if you specify this names too, so yeah, what do you want the new names to be? They default, this one defaults to name and this one defaults to value, but this is how you overwrite overwrite the defaults. So hopefully that, answer that answers that question. Uh, Great, and everyone agrees that there should be a, a full join, so that's yeah. that's we've good. Got a few more. If just refresh the page once more, from oh, a few really? more responses come in. <laughs> I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we've got two. Um, uh, I've got a few. So the majority agree with full join. We've got a few people saying left join, and a few people saying inner join. Um, so let me just go. And we can actually try the different options. So the option I want wanted was full join. And the reason I'm saying full join is because I don't, it's uh, it's this part. So if I want to keep all of the observations, um, even if they only exist in say data set X, then I need to use a full join. So if I use a left join, Anything that appears in um, data set Y that's not in data set X will be dropped. Um, and if I use an inner join, I will only be left um, with the ones that appear in both data sets. Um, so that's that's the reason for for why I wanted the full join. I think it's actually probably slightly more common to be using. I mainly use left joins. Um, but I think it's just it's worth noting that all of these joins will work like your code will not crash but you'll end up with very different results and that's why I was saying earlier that you need to really think about what you actually want to achieve because nothing's going to crash on you it's just going to give you a slightly different answer to what you maybe wanted um, so We've agreed that we're going to do a full join. Um, so what I'm going to do is go back to our studio and join the data sets together. And I 
think because I'm essentially like a uh, um, like those TV chefs that prepare things, I actually have a long version of uh, of this 60 second one. No, I don't. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just create a long version of that. Uh, in my slides. Right, this is where it gets, this is a danger of live coding where you realise you've missed out on one data set and um, let me just go and find it. Um, Okay, yeah. I'll just do this quickly to make sure that it's uh, we can move on to the next exercise. Um, so what I've done is I'm creating this long data set. So I'm reshaping it in the exact same way as I did with the ones for all the calls. I'm creating a date variable, but what I'm doing just to make things slightly more complicated is but I'm renaming this variable uh, date underscore 60 seconds. And that's because I want to show you a really neat trick that you can use in, in these join functions. So I'm going to call this citrep um, full. And I'm going to use a full join. And when you're doing a full join, the order of your data set doesn't really matter, but it will matter if you're using a left join or a right join. So just Again, keep that in mind. Um, so I'm going to join my two long data sets together. Um, and what you can do is in this by statement, so I'm saying join this one and that one by these variables. Um, so it's called NHS 111. The area name variable is the same in both data sets. Uh, but the date variable has actually got a slightly different name because I renamed it. Uh, so what I can do um, is I don't have to actually go back and rename that in the original data set. I can just say that well my second data set, which I haven't given the right name, has got a different date. It's got a different name. Uh, and this is what it is. So match this one on that one. Um, and now we can look at our Citrep full uh, data and you can see that something quite annoying has happened, which is that actually the variables that were the same in both data sets that we didn't merge on now have this annoying suffix called like dot y and dot x, just indicating which data set it came from, which is good because you don't want to end up with two variables with the same name. But having them called dot x and dot y isn't great. So what you can do is specify the suffix option uh, where you can say here, for example, I want to call this all because it has all the calls. And here I want to say 60 sec. Uh, so if we go back to look at that, um, this has now got, and I mean, I would probably have dropped these variables earlier, the year all and day month, but you can see that now we've got calls all and calls 60 seconds. So you now have really clear variable names and you actually know what you can do with that. Um, uh, so yeah, it's just worth these noting that the variables you join on don't have to have the same name. I know I was using Stata before and I think that was a big problem. You can join on multiple variables. You don't have to just join on one and you can add a suffix for variables that appear in both data sets. So then I also just want to maybe a quick, quick warning is that if you don't specify the by option and just do this, it's, it will join by all the ones that are, this, like, are in both data sets and have the same names in both data sets. And in this situation, it's actually fine, but it might not always be. So even if it will let you run things without uh, specifying the buy option, I, I would recommend always specifying it because also when you read the code, you want to be able to know what it's actually joining on. Uh, but just to let you know that it will it will work 
and sometimes I run it without to see what the variables are called and then I, I put it in. So there's a second type of joins that you can use and they're called filtering joins and they match in the same way as mutating joins but it only affects the observations so you don't get any extra variables. Uh, so anti-join will drop anything in X that matches in Y. Actually, I think this image is maybe a bit misleading. Uh, whereas semi-join is the same as inner join, um, but it keeps, um, but it doesn't add any columns. So for example, you might have a data set of patients and in the second one, you might have a data set of patients with a, say, a positive COVID test. All you really need is, all you really want is to know who's in that second data set. There's no other, there might not be any other information in there. So then you can use a semi-join to just kind of add, add the information that, um, or like to get a list of the ones that do have a positive COVID test. An anti-join is usually really good to find out what doesn't match because you're, yeah, you're left with the ones that aren't, no, actually that's the right one. Um, you're left with the ones that don't have a match or like no overlap with Y. Uh, so here, for example, we have another data set I've called regions, um, which has got the region, like the kind of bigger NHS region and the yeah, NHS 111 area name. So I'll just show you the data set real quick so that you know exactly what it looks like. Uh, but yeah, it's just got this region, this code and this NHS 111 area name that we can use to join it onto our old data set. Um, so I have this Citrup full data set and I now want to add in the region to that so that I can have the bigger region. If I want to check that there's a match for each one, how would I do that? So I'm going to go over to Mentimeter again. Uh, and Tom will be able to tell me once people start answering. Yeah, I'll hopefully um, switch it over so you should see the, uh, the okay. next question appear now. Um, I, I think the, the anti joins and semi joins, it's. Um, there isn't like a direct link to those in SQL, whereas we've got left joins and right joins in SQL. Um, oh, OK, but I, I think the anti join is most similar to writing a, a not exists or a not in where statement or a semi join is like the in um, kind of query or an exists query. OK, well, that's really good to know, actually. Uh, I'll refresh again. I actually use anti joins quite a lot because yes, when you're not sure, yeah, uh, we've got a lot of answers for anti-join. Uh, got one or a few for, well probably one actually because I've got five people voting. Um, but I have to say like I find that I can read SQL code slightly more easily because I've been using DeepIR for so long. Look, I feel like the syntax do, it's nice to not have to relearn everything. Uh, okay, so we've got a lot of votes for anti-join, a few for semi-join and a few for for left join. Um, so I'll just go back and I might actually go back to uh, um, um, sorry, to our studio to just show you. So if I want to know which ones do not appear, then I want to use the anti-join. So with a left join, I would, um, a left join is probably one I want to, want to do later now that I know that the regions, if the region's fine, quick code is fine, um, because I want to add the region to my original data set. Um, so let me just first do an anti-join uh, with Citrip full and regions I think I might have been I'm just going to check because I think what I did was I changed the name of yeah so I need to specify the by which 
is I only need to join by region because I only I don't have different ones for different um, dates uh, and this needs to be quoted uh, but what I did was I changed this so that's actually got a small um, uh, lowercase NHS um, so if I run this um, you can tell that there are actually 35 areas that don't appear in this um, in the region file um, which means that something has gone wrong like that there's something wrong with that file so if I just joined them together it would have created a problem because I there would have been some some bits where I wouldn't actually have a region so if I do this for example uh, and we look at which ones you know you've got a region here uh, but I think what I did um, so for some of these so because what I've done is actually in the region file just dropped anyone any region that has the word south in it and you now have after doing a left join this region is missing and this code is missing and there's not really an easy like you can check for you can check when this is missing in your data set obviously after you've done the join but it's usually a bit easier to do these anti joins to just look at what's um, what's missing uh, because you can also then kind of, you know, create summary statistics around that. A semi join, you'll see, um, returns not very many rows, but it actually doesn't keep, it doesn't add my the variables from the regions data set. Uh, so that's why I don't want to use that one. Uh, what I do have as well as this other, this last data set, I promise I'm not going to throw more data sets at you, called areas of interest. Um, and it's only got a few kind of regions in it. Um, and I'm going to load it. Um, and you can see as well um, uh, this. So areas of interest doesn't have that many, you know, it's only got a few areas that we might be interested in for some type of reason. And now what I want to do is just figure out, I want, only want to keep the observations in Citrep full that also appears in areas of interest, but I don't want to keep any of the variables from areas of interest because I don't, I, I only care about knowing that they actually appear in that data set. So this is our last Mentimeter question uh, and yeah, this is very small actually. So what I'm going to do is go back to this so you can see the different options. But do I want to use an anti-join, a semi-join or an inner join? So again, I should have advanced the, um, the questions for you and I, th I think it is a bit more readable on the um, the, the kind of questioning yeah. stage. Um, they're a bit small on the, the charts. Yeah. <laughs> so I was yeah I was trying to include it, it, all the different bits of the code might have been too ambitious. So while we were um, waiting for some responses to come through on this, um, we've had one question that came through about yeah. can we get duplicated rows because of joining data? Yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so I think that's another reason why you need to be careful um, because obviously I've been using the Citric full and then adding the region. Um, and then, you know, if I think of the Citrep full as my base data set, I don't actually end up with more uh, with more variables. But if I'd been thinking of the region data set as my base one and I'm adding a data set with more rows, it will just duplicate all of the rows. Um, so that's yeah, that's kind of why you know you really want to keep an eye on what's happening and make sure that that's that's what you want. And it's also worth really, really reading uh, the help files for these different functions because it will like I find it, it can sometimes be a bit hard to remember exactly what it will do um, but just checking and you know sometimes even just creating a small data set that you know will work in a certain way. Yeah I, I that's why I love the anti-join and semi-join functions because um, a, a pattern that I often see of writing queries in SQL is to 
left joint to another table and then write a aware statement that says where the um, ID in the, the, the table that you've joined to is null. Um, at, uh, and that yeah. can lead to duplicated rows as well if you've not got a, um, a unique key that you're joining on. Yeah. Um, I think it's just like you can really go from like a thousand rows to like 10,000 rows without intending to and yeah if you're not paying attention. Okay um, so we've got uh, 17 votes um, and the majority of people are saying semi-join which is the answer I was after and then we've got one vote for inner join and one for anti-join um, and I'll just quickly go back and show why we wouldn't we'd want the different ones and I'm actually just gonna make it because I realise we've only got eight minutes left. Um, I'm gonna do it in a slightly cheeky way and just copy the code. Um, so if I do an anti-join, actually let's just go back and so what I wanted to do was I wanted to start with Citric full but I only want to keep the rows that have areas of interest in them. But I don't actually care about any of the variables in the areas of interest. I think these are the two key points. Um, so if I do an anti-join between these two, I will end up with anything that doesn't match. Uh, but I said that I wanted observations that also appear in areas of interest. So anti-join is not going to give me what I want. Um, a in a join will get me closer to what I want, but you can see that, and it's even more obvious if I do this. So I'm going to maximize this window because I realize it got really small. Um, I've ended up with these variables at the end that I said that I didn't want. Um, I'm going to have to close some of these. Um, whereas a semi join is going to give me the same number of rows as I got before with my inner join but I'm not going to get those extra variables that I don't need um, and you know this is a toy example so you know I've only got a few extra columns it wouldn't have been the end of the world but sometimes you're actually joining to a table that's really big and it can get you know it it can crash your computer right, if you add too much too much data. Uh, so hopefully that explains why that wasn't what we wanted. And that was my last Mentimeter question and my last uh, kind of point. So thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I would really encourage you to uh, have a look at the vignettes, especially for TidyR, but also for DeepIR, because there are a lot of functions in there that are actually really, really handy. Um, and just do a bit of a deep dive. I actually learned quite a lot preparing these slides, just looking at the different examples. So thank you. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yes, we do. Um, so just a, a, a quick um, note, if we'd love to get your um, feedback on this session just so we can help improve any future sessions, get to know what you want to hear about. Um, so I sent that link in the Q&A just. Um, the other thing to announce um, in terms of webinars is um, the next event. I'm just going to post the link into the chat now, but we've got Chris Maney from UHB, I believe, and he's going to be talking about the kind of how and why of when you create packages. So kind of taking your R skills to the next level. Um, the other thing I guess we, we should be announcing at this stage is we've got the um, we had to cancel the in-person NHSR conference for this year, unfortunately. Um, but what we are going to be um, doing instead is having a kind of a set of virtual conference C type events um, at the same time in November. The first week is going to be a series of um, kind of introductory workshops. And then the second week is going to be full of um, great content. So keep an eye out we'll be announcing that soon about how to kind of um, sign up um, we'd be really interested in getting as many of you speaking at the conference so um, there'll be details about that coming up shortly too um, so definitely get in touch if you think you've got something that you'd like to share with us um, join us on the slack channel and just give a shout out to me I'm more than happy to discuss that um, but 
um, we have um, one kind of question that came through about um, the, the Mr. Beginning. So the slides have some of the code used. Is there a complete R file? And it should be all in the, the GitHub repository, I believe, Emma. Yeah, so what I will do, so I tried to make sure that anything that I was coding, live coding was also in the slides. But what I can do is just add the live coding uh, document to GitHub as well. And you should be able to find everything there, including the slides. Brilliant. Um, I wanted so, to say as well, just a, so around the, the question about duplicating rows, I haven't used these functions very much, but I think you can use union. I think there's a function called union if you want to. It's worth looking into those if you if you are not sure whether or not one of these join functions are for you. I think the unions can, they will kind of not duplicate values. So that might be another thing worth looking into. Um, I think it's the union and intersection functions. All right. So we've had one question come through. Um, did you have any issues with dplyr stroke tidyr implicitly converting to a tibble rather than remaining as the usual input of a data frame? Um, I, I mean, it probably does convert things to a tibble. I think it's, and I've had a few instances when that has been an issue. Um, I, yeah, it probably does do that as by default. I, I'm not sure, but I, I, that would be my guess. I haven't really had big issues with it. Um, yeah, I mean, a, a, a tibble is is just a, a kind of a super class of a, a data frame. So a, a tibble is a data frame. So uh, it'd be nice to know kind of what issues you have if it's converting them. You, you may have issues if you're using a data table and it converted them. Um, mm. um, data tables way outside of my area of expertise. Um, and that could be the issue. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you've got some kind of specific problem there, it'd be great to hear about it in the Slack channel. Um, but anyway, th it's, we've had a couple of people coming in and thanking Emma, and I, I just wanted to extend my thanks. It's been a really wonderful presentation. Um, mm, thank I learned you. a lot myself there, and um, it's really great. So thank you very much, and we will see you at the next webinar, hopefully. Goodbye, all. Great. Bye. Thank you.